Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. While we typically focus on local governance issues, we recognize the importance of the broader political landscape on municipal affairs. That's why here on this show, we have decided to sit down with federal, provincial, and territorial leaders to delve into their perspectives on the municipal governance of their province, territory, or the federal government, and how their levels of government are addressing the municipal concerns. That's why today our guest is Gil McGowan, the current president of the Alberta Federation of Labour and currently running to be the next leader of the Alberta NDP. In our 101 interview, we will discuss his leadership aspirations, his vision for Alberta's future, and perhaps most importantly to our audience and to me, his vision for municipalities across the province of Alberta, both urban and rurally. This is Municipal Affairs. Gil, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to get to sort of the simple but overarching question of this entire interview is, You've decided to put your name, well, you have put your name forward to be the next leader of the Alberta NDP. Why you? Why now? Well, thanks, Chris, and thanks for having me on. Um, well, from my perspective, it's imperative that Daniel Smith be defeated in 2027 and that we have a Alberta NDP uh, government. Um, Daniel Smith is a threat to the future of our province. She She's uh, driving away investment uh, she's driving down wages, she's destroying our public services, she's attacking vulnerable Albertans, uh, and she's refusing, well, she's denying climate change, and she's re she's refusing to prepare our economy for the future. Um, any one of those things would probably disqualify her in the minds of many Albertans, but all those things together uh, just mean that, I mean, she's the worst possible uh, leader to be in charge of our province at this particular and this is and I, one of the reasons I've thrown my hat into the ring is because I believe very strongly that our province is at a crossroads uh, in terms of uh, our economic future. Um, a, a lot of Albertans don't like to think about it, but uh, there is a global energy transition underway and uh, the world has started that bumpy process of moving away from fossil fuels. And, um, you know, my day job, I'm the president of Alberta's largest worker organization, the Alberta Federation of Labor, and we represent a lot of people working in oil and gas, oil and gas related construction, manufacturing, and we've been looking at the horizon for more than a decade now and watching the trends. And um, and frankly, we're, we're worried about the future um, and because the, the engine of our economy, the oil and gas sector, uh, is... Um, is going to be affected by these unfolding trends and, and it's not like we can't just choose not to participate in these trends they're happening whether we like them or not um and so you know we you know as a worker organization for the you know to preserve the interests of our members um and promote the future of an Al a prosperous alberta economy we've sort of come to the conclusion that it's better to prepare for a future that that's going to look different than our past then stick our heads in the sand and that you know while we can't choose the direction of that the, the global economy is taking we can choose how we respond to it um but unfortunately you know we have we have a, a premier and a, and a party the, the ucp that are deep in denial and um and it's albertans who are going to pay the price for that denial if we're not prepared for change when it comes and um you know one of my biggest fears is that Alberta will become sort of a northern rust belt, um, you know, as as the rest of the world moves on and you know seizes opportunities associated with a lower carbon economy. If if we don't get on that train, we're going to be left behind. And uh, and it's pretty clear now that Daniel Smith is not getting on that train. Um, and um, and 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 you know, working people are the first ones who are going to pay the price for that. So you know. Um, you know, and so that's what motivates me to to you know to defeat Daniel Smith in the um, in the next election. But you ask the question, why me? And that goes to my <laughs> that my diagnosis of the problem, right? Because you know, before we can de defeat Daniel Smith in twenty twenty seven, we have to figure out why we lost to her in twenty twenty three. And put simply, we lost because we didn't attract the support of enough working Albertans. And uh, this is not just a notion that I've come up with. It's something that's reflected in the polling. 
Uh, that includes polling that um, that we've done at the Alberta Federation of Labor, but it's also reflective of polling from many of the major pollsters, including Janet Brown, who's sort of the guru of uh, public opinion research here in Alberta. Um, all the polls, sh you know, show the same story, right? And uh, you know, the New Democrats won uh, quite comfortably uh, among university educated. Albertans and among Albertans who describe themselves as middle class, but we lost uh, among uh, Albertans who describe themselves as working class and who have uh, you know college uh, or trades education or have only have high school education, um, and that's like forty percent of the population. Just to be clear, um, and so that, that's too big of a group to be ignored. And there is an irony here because the, the, the NDP is supposed to be the workers' party. It was formed um, on that, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> correctly. <laughs> yeah, and that's, you know, that it was formed in uh, the, the NDP, for those who don't know, and this, uh, this is me being a little bit of a history geek, but uh, the NDP was formed in 1961 as a historic uh, uh, collaboration between uh, the CCF, the, Co the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, which was the left of center party, at that time, and the Canadian Labour Congress, which is the umbrella organization for unions in the country. So, and my federation, the federation that I've led uh, here in Alberta, the Alberta Federation of Labour, uh, we are associated with the CLC. So it's it's basically our organization that helped create the NDP. And, and we did it uh, because um, we said, you know, uh, the, you know, merchants and business people, they had their parties, they had the Conservative Party, they had the Liberal Party, and uh, we basically said uh, it's time for working people to have their own party. That that's that was the genesis of uh, of of the NDP. And uh, it never, you know, the NDP has never formed a federal government, but they have formed many provincial governments, especially here in Western Canada. In, in fact, we've had and you know very successful NDP governments in every single province, including Alberta, under Rachel <laughs> Notley. She built a winning coalition. Surprised the heck of all out of a lot of people, but she she governed well during a difficult difficult time, right? So, um, you know, the NDP is the is the alternative. We've established ourselves as the alternative to the UCP here in Alberta, and and Rachel built a coalition that came very close in the last election. It was basically a 50-50 election, lost by a few hundred votes here, a few few hundred votes there. And so, what I'm saying is that in order to win in 2027. We have to find that missing piece in our coalition, and that missing piece is working people. And we, you know, uh, and what we're seeing here in Alberta is, is similar to what uh, we've seen elsewhere in Canada, and, and indeed in the whole Western, uh, you know, democratic world. Uh, you know, where where right wing politicians like Trump in the states or Polyev at the national level have uh, played on very legitimate worker anxieties to advance their own. Uh, you know, political interests. Um, and, uh, and so and they've been, you know, they've been turning this anxiety into anger, and then that anger into a political movement. And what I'm saying is that in order to win in 2027, we have to recognize that that's happening. Uh, and all the recent polling shows that it's happening even more than it was each six months or a year ago. Um, but we have to address that we have we, we and, 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 you know, as someone who's, you know, spent the last 19 years representing working people in this province from both the public and private sector. Um, you know, standing up for working people is my is my job, but it's also my passion. And um, and I, I think that we win by going back to our roots and reminding ourselves that we are a workers party and actually listening to what working Albertans are saying. And uh, and what they're saying is that they're really worried and that they're anxious. Um, and, um, and, and it's, you know, whereas the conservative parties like Polyev and the UCP and Trump south of the border, they turn that anxiety to anger. Our mission should be to turn that anxiety into hope, um, by actually acknowledging their con working people's concerns and providing solutions. So, um, and so that's why, you know, like, frankly, I, yeah, go ahead. I was going to okay. How do you see yourself building that bridge? Because that is a big coalition that you want to build to sort of take on the UCP in 27, 2027 here, if the election is 
held in the schedule of the time frame, which I don't expect it not to be. But how do you see yourself building on the coalition that the Notley government uh, made and adding in those workers that you sort of have said have not been the base of the coalition that the Notley uh, regime, and I say regime as in like their government, and uh, for those who know me, they should, for transparency's sake, as I always say on the end of the, every interview, my husband was part of the Notley government. He was a cabinet minister in this government, in that government. So he has talked to me about the coalition that was made. How do you see yourself in building onto that coalition and adding in those workers that were once the sort of the backbone of what the NDP were in the 60s and 70s and the sort of moved more to the center and lost the workers and to a, the conservative government in some sense. Yeah, well, I, I I think that the the things that most working Albertans are concerned about are similar to the things that, uh, that, that the people are already in the NDP coalition are concerned about. So as I mentioned, the, the, the NDP coalition is built around university educated Albertans, uh, people who describe themselves as middle class. Um, and there is an urban skew, there's a skew towards women. Um, but in order to, you know, to, to build that coalition, uh, to be large enough to, you know, tip us over the top and win it in a head to head election with UCP, we're, we're, we're not talking about stuff that's, you know, brand new. We're just uh, talking, we, we need to talk about the things that are top of mind for working people, um, and you know, and number one is is the cost of living crisis. Uh, the, the, like everything else, takes you know to, to takes uh, a backseat to the cost of living crisis right now, and uh, and and this is not a surprise, right? So like if if you're working an hourly wage, um, you know you have a relatively modest income. Uh, every time the cost of living goes up, inflation goes up it becomes that much more difficult. Um, and so, you know, so that's, you know, so the first thing that, and, and you'll, you'll see on my, I have a website, perhaps not surprisingly, Gilmgowan for Alberta.ca. And uh, it was my intention to roll out my platform in, in stages over seven weeks, but by popular demand, I'm trying to get it all on the website at once so people don't have to wait seven weeks. So within a day or two, it'll all be there. But and for those who are watching this, much. the link's in the show notes. If you want to check out Gil's uh, website and also uh, any social media that he has, all the links will be in the show notes. So just check it out. I apologize to interrupt there, just so that way you don't yeah, have no, to no, that's spell okay. it out yeah. for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you never have to apologize for promoting my website. That's fine. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so, so basically what I'm saying is, you know, the, the, you know, the, the things that will a appeal to working Albertans uh, are the things that uh, everyone's talking about right now. Then, so the first is the economy, right? So people and people want to know how we're going to maintain our prosperity in a changing world. And so the the first thing that our governments have to do and our political parties have to acknowledge that change is coming and have a plan to prepare for it. So I have quite a robust plan, uh, which basically uh, argues that in order for us to prepare for uh, you know this unfolding global energy transition and make sure that not, we're not left behind. We need to embrace this idea of uh, government-led industrial policy to pivot our economy towards the lower carbon future. Uh, it's going to happen, uh, but it may not happen here. It may happen like the investments may happen in other jurisdictions, um, and we may be left behind. That's what I want to avoid. And so, what I'm suggesting is that we take, ironically, the 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 kind of uh, focus on government-led industrial policy that was used by the Lougheed government in the 70s. He used a mix of regulation, direct public investment, public ownership even, uh, to pivot the economy towards uh, uh, what was new then, the oil sands and petrochemicals, because we were running out of conventional oil. And he, pivot, he, he used a whole apparatus of government to pivot the, the economy and basically said to the private sector, come along for the ride. Uh, this is the way we're going to go. And... Um, there's actually an economist right now, Marianne Mazzucato, um, who wrote a book called The, the uh, Mission Economy. And she said that this is the way that, that all of our, our world's industrial powers have shaped their economies. You know, the, the government on behalf of citizens and the public interest have set a direction um, and, and then the, their economies have prospered. That's true of the United States. It's true of Great Britain. It's true of all the Western European countries after the Second World War. 
It's true of uh, Korea, Japan. So what I'm saying is that we need to take a lesson from Lougheed, uh, use these tools of, of government-led industrial policy for our current situation, which is to pivot towards a lower carbon future. So we look back at Lougheed, but I think we can also look to south of the border uh, at the Biden administration, and they're doing that exact th that exact thing right now. They're embracing government-led industrial policy through pieces of legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act, and they're pivoting the American economy uh, towards the, the lower carbon future, seizing these opportunities. And the that policy has has led to literally trillions of dollars in, of investment, created hundreds of thousands of jobs in in new industries. Um, including renewables, uh, but many other industries as well. And so what I'm saying is that uh, is, is not should we follow the Lougheed lessons and the, and, and the lessons from Biden and the IRA south of the board. It's what, why the heck aren't we doing it already, right? And why are we resisting it? So that's the first thing. So people, like working people want to know that there's a future, a prosperous future. And, uh, and, and I think that we've got like in what I, I've laid out in on my website is 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 a is is a roadmap for for us getting there. The second thing, and I'm going to be blunt about this, is wages. Um, so we talk about jobs. Second thing that working people are worried about is wages, and they, they there's every good reason for them to be worried right now. I, I mean, Alberta for the last 25 years or so, we've had the highest wages in the country. Uh, back in 2014, our average wages were about. 20% higher than any other province. But that gap has been narrowing. And, and in fact, since the UCP took over in 2019, uh, we've had the slowest wage growth in the whole country, bar none. There's no other province that has seen their wages grow less. And so what's happened is that, uh, that, that the wage advantage that we used to have had has almost disappeared entirely. And in fact, I, I, would ask, I, I told the, 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 uh, the UCP minister, uh, responsible for they they abolished the labor department, so they have this this guy named Matt Jones, who's who's now he's technically the labor minister, but they call him a jobs and economy minister. I met with him a couple of months ago, and I said it's going to be on your watch that we lose our wage advantage. And uh, he had nothing to say. like he he like he didn't argue it. Uh, he couldn't because it's happening, uh, but he had nothing to offer. And so um, so so there's a real wage problem, which is exacerbated by the, the you know, rapid rise in, in the cost of living. And so what my position is, and that this is this is my message to working people, is that um, that the best way to help Albertans cope with the rising cost of living is to make sure they have wages that increase at least for inflation. And um, and, and that that's not a that's not a radical concept. The only way that workers have Doesn't ever seem kept like up, it there. <laughs> and no, but it, I mean, the only way that workers have ever kept up with with rising costs of inflation is wages increases that catch up. And anything that's less than a way than inflation increase is a, is a cut to your actual uh, purchasing power. And so, you know, in the same way that businesses, you know, they say we need to create policy conditions that will attract investment. Here's the reality: governments can create policy conditions that encourage wage increases. And so, so like, I'm like, I will, it's not on my website yet. It's the next thing that's coming up, but within probably tomorrow, <laughs> uh, there, there will be a suite of policies that we can implement to make sure that wages go up to match inflation. And it's, and it's urgent because inflation has gone up by about 15% over the last two, two and a half years alone. And um, and wages are not keeping up. So you know, so increasing the minimum wage, indexing it for inflation, making it easier for people to to build their bargaining power in the workplace by joining unions, getting rid of uh, the UCP's ridiculous changes uh, that allow employers to, to more easily avoid paying overtime. Um, you know that that's. That, you know, like we need to create conditions that allow people to get wage increases. So, so that's the second thing. The third thing that uh, will win workers over, I think, to the New Democrat column, is to actually have a conversation about uh, costs and the rising cost of living. Um, that's that's more than just political spin, right? Because like we we've got this whole, you know, the the the, the federal conservatives in particular, under Pierre Polyev, they've convinced. Albertans and other Canadians that if they get rid of the carbon tax, all of a sudden, you know, all the cost of living issues are going to disappear. And, you know, pardon my language, but that's 
horse droppings. I was going to say another word, but oh, it's like, trust me, but I, I, have said, I, I have said on numerous occasions that uh, you take away a tax, I guarantee you, and I, I would say this on this show, on any, if there was a conservative person on this show, wherever you, if you take away any taxes, prices just don't randomly disappear. They will always stay the same. I have never seen yeah. an inflation, uh, sort of inflationary crisis where prices just magically go back to being where they were prior to the inflationary problems. There's my little rant. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. I mean, so, you know, uh, I remember, uh, like, you know, like, honestly, this has gone beyond uh, a rational conversation. And I and I, I accept that most Canadians have, you know, turned their backs on the carbon tax. And uh, honestly, I'm, I'm not going to fight that because I remember when it was being introduced, I was president at that time. And, um, you know, because it was the Alberta NDP that introduced uh, a carbon tax before the, there was a federal carbon tax. And the federal carbon tax is actually modeled on the carbon tax that was introduced by the Notley NDP. And so I was there at the front end when these conversations were going on. And I remember saying, this is too complicated. <laughs> and, uh, the, you know, the rebate is great, but people won't get that. Uh, and as it's turned out, people don't understand it, even though they do receive the, the rebate. And what I said at the time is that, you know, basically, if you want to encourage people to reduce their emissions, there are two ways to do it. You can, you know, put the price on pollution, which, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a strong argument, okay? But the other alternative is to provide incentives to people to do the things that would reduce their emissions. So, for example, if you want them to, uh, you know, to better insulate their homes, give them incentives to do that, you know? So new windows, better insulation, give them a, give them a subsidy. If you want them to drive uh, electric vehicles or consider driving electric vehicles, make it cheaper for them to buy them through a subsidy. Um, you know, so that's the alternative to a price on pollution <laughs> is uh, is regulation and and subsidies. And so, um, yeah. So anyway, my, my so my point is that getting rid of the carbon tax is not going to be the the big solution to cost savings that uh, people like Pierre Polyev say it's going to be. But there are things that our provincial government could do to uh, reduce costs for for ordinary Albertans, and and this is pressing because you know uh, in the same way at the same time that wages are going down in Alberta, costs are going up. In fact, we've we've had we've recorded the highest rate of inflation among Canadian provinces, and that's not an accident. It's actually the result of UCP policy, and I'm not sure uh, enough people have connected the dots. But so so you know, for example, uh, we're the only province in the whole country that has a fully privatized and deregulated electrical power system. So mo most other provinces have crown corporations and uh, and uh, regulated utility boards that set the prices. In every other province, uh, the costs are dramatically lower, not just a little bit lower, but a lot lower. And it's because we have this privatized system. So if we want to uh, you know, help Albertans out by having lower bills, what I'm proposing is that we re-regulate <laughs> our uh, power system, that we introduce a public power corporation uh, to compete on the generation side, and uh, and so that we can enjoy the same kind of low prices that our neighbors in, uh, in BC on one side and Saskatchewan on the other side have with a regulated publicly provided power system. At the same time, if you, you look at the other Western provinces, they have uh, public auto insurance. That was another area where our uh, costs were much, much higher uh, than elsewhere. So let's, 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 you know, like every, the new Democrats, when they were in power in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, BC, they all introduced uh, public auto insurance and uh, the people in those provinces have been enjoying much lower rates ever since. It's time for us to do that here. So a public power, re-regulated power, uh, uh, public auto insurance, and then housing, housing, okay? Like, you know, there's no other issue where that has caused more anxiety, especially for younger Albertans about, uh, we have the high, high, we have had the fastest rising rents in the whole, uh, in, in the whole country. Like there's no other problems. Like it's still more expensive to rent an apartment in Vancouver or Toronto than it is in Edmonton or Calgary, but we're catching up. Um, because our rents have gone up faster than anywhere else. Uh, so we need rent control. And uh, Janice Irwin from the New Democrats has introduced uh, a private member's bill to that effect. I support it. Uh, I would like to see it made permanent. Uh, but in addition, uh, and I also want to support our municipalities in terms of building new houses. We, like, you know, Edmonton is already in the, is a little bit further along than Calgary, but rezoning to make it easier to build different kinds of housing stock 
uh, that's that that needs to be supported. Our municipalities, they're on the front lines of this. So like I like if I were premier, I would support those efforts, but I would also supplement them uh, by introducing a uh, a public Alberta housing corporation that would actually build uh, housing stock. And uh, and I'm not talking about. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you you mentioned my favorite word, and that is municipalities. As we have municipal leaders who listen to the show on a regular basis, yeah. and we speak to municipal leaders across. There's a few things I want to talk about here in your uh, conversation. Yeah, well, just so let me far. finish this thing about the Alberta okay. yeah, Housing go Corporation. For it. Like, I, I, you know, like, I, I don't, I, I know that conservatives will say, oh, he's going to build this kind of big public housing project that's just going to fall into, in, into disrepair. First of all, those housing projects like in the States that have fallen in disrepair, they fell into disrepair because the conservative governments let them fall into disrepair. But that's not actually what I have in mind. Like, like I've been looking around the world and uh, there are public models to build housing that aren't on this public housing model in the States. Like, If you look at a lot of Western Europe, lots of middle class people live in publicly constructed houses and they often own them. Uh, and, um, and, and places like Singapore, um, you know, like th they basically, you know, the, the government will pile all sorts of money in to make sure everyone in their, in their, in their, in their jurisdiction is well housed and people can, uh, either buy the stuff that's created, that's built by the, the public sector, or they can lease it and it gives a lower cost option. Uh, and then they can sell the leases. Right. Um, that, and th there's another model in, in Vancouver, the, the indigenous groups, the Musqueam in particular, own, own the land. They invite private developers to come in to build things. Then people can buy these like 99 year leases and then they can sell them from one to another. There's all sorts of creative stuff, but the, the, the private sector is, is they're trying and it'll be better once we have better zoning laws. But what I'm saying is that we need a public housing corporation to supplement the private sector to make sure that we actually hit these ambitious goals for, uh, for uh, you know, to build more housing units. So, um, so I mean, so, so, and all, like, these are concrete policies, right? The, the you know, the auto, public auto insurance, public power, um, uh, you know, public housing corporation. These are not radical ideas. They've been implemented in other Canadian jurisdictions. They've been out in, implemented, uh, heck, some of them have been implemented in Alberta. Like, the, like we used to have a regulated power system. Not that long ago, before like before two thousand one, when uh, Ralph Klein uh, took a meat cleaver to it, um, the I call it the enronization of uh, our our public utilities, right? And you know how how well things turned out for for people who invested in Enron. We're paying that price right now. So so you know so uh, you know so like a, a jobs agenda for a changing world. Uh, a way, uh, uh, you know, a, a wage increase for Albertans by by, by setting uh, public policy that will encourage, uh, give work workers more bargaining power and encourage higher wages, and then a, 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 an affordability agenda that includes using, you know, the tool, the lever, the levers that are available to government to actually bring costs down. The final thing that I'd say on the affordability side is that we have to understand where, um, you know, increasing costs have come from. I mean like the conservatives have tried to say oh it's the carbon tax or it's the liberals fault and you know but the reality is that what what happened and most economists have come have accepted this as a reality is that why did we have this big spike in inflation it was because of uh supply chain issues related to the war in ukraine and the pandemic um but also the fact that a lot of big corporations used those supply chain disruptions as a pretext to uh to gouge consumers so that, that that's what happened and and they and it was usually because uh it, it was especially with companies that had market power they had oligopolies and so they you know employer uh, customers didn't have that many options and so oil companies grocery stores those are the two biggest energy costs and food costs were what really drove um a, a big chunk of the affordability crisis uh, and along with the uh, issues related to, to housing, right? So those three things, right? So, so my, my final policy solution is to introduce an excess profits tax, not to generate a whole bunch of money, because honestly, if, if, if I were to do that, a McGowan government <laughs> introducing an excess profits tax, whatever money we raise from it, I would just redistribute it back out to, to ordinary Albertans. The point would be to provide a disincentive for employers 
to engage in price gouging behavior, right? So th there'll be a penalty that would discard. So I want, I, I want them to stop price gouging. And if they don't price gouge to, to pad their profits, then they won't have to pay the tax. That's the point, right? So provide, provide an incentive for them to actually behave like better corporate citizens. And, and you know, and you know, I don't want to single out you know any one sector, but let, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> the, the grocery sector, they doubled their margins. They doubled their margins. Like it's always been a tight margin industry. It was like you know, like a two percent margin, but they they made money on volume. But now their margins are like five percent. Right. And so and, and and they're making huge profits. Same with the oil companies, like like they've never made bigger profits than they have over the last couple of years. And uh, and they've made those and, and it's those it's that price gouging behavior that has been the one of the, you know, the, the big the big driver of inflation. So let's let's disincentivize it. You've talked about a lot of things over the last. Yeah, 15 minutes here. And uh, there's a lot of things that overlap with a lot of conversations I'm having with municipal leaders across this country, across this province, I should say, not this country. I do speak to municipal leaders across this country, but in Alberta specifically. I want to talk about one particular area, and that is the Alberta Energy Regulator. Earlier yeah. this year, RMA came out with a staggering number that almost a half a billion, a quarter of a billion dollars of unpaid property taxes from oil and gas companies, not all, but some, have gone unpaid to municipalities. Paul McLaughlin, the president of RMA, has come out and said the AER needs to be less of a cheerleader and start doing its job when it comes to regulating the industry. Now, you have called on your website, which I've said is linked in the show notes, for a reform of the AER. Why is this specifically an important issue for you? And how do you see this helping municipalities get back some of those unpaid property taxes from these, as, as RMA calls them, zombie oil and gas companies who are not paying their property taxes to the municipalities? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question, Chris. Uh, it's really important. Um, and uh, for a number of reasons, the first, uh, and maybe just for your for your listeners, the the Alberta Energy Regulator is uh, supposed to uh, their their job is to regulate oil and gas and coal, right? And and they're supposed to be the the public watchdog, looking after the public interest. Um, but as Paul McLaughlin said, they they're no longer a watchdog. It's clear they're a lapdog, and um, and so. What I've said on my website, and which what I'll repeat here, is that if I were to become premier, I'd fire the lot of them. Um, right now, we have uh, a CEO that is, uh, you know, you know, so from the oil and gas industry itself, and the the whole board is a bunch of oil and gas uh, retired oil and gas executives or consultants. There's there isn't a single uh, person on the board who's there to represent the broader public interest. And uh, what, what's also equally shocking is that even though the AER is supposed to be the regulator in the public interest, the whole, the whole organization is paid for by the oil and gas industry. It's not paid for out of general revenue. It's paid for by the oil and gas industry. So they're, they're paid by the industry that they're supposed to regulate. Um, and then the whole board comes from uh, the industry that they're supposed to regulate. And so this is this is sort of the definition of a captured regulator, right? So economists talk about a, cap, a regulator being captured by the industry. And th th this is textbook, right? And so if I were to become premier, literally day one, I would fire the CEO, I would fire the entire uh, board. There, it's, un, like, in, in the, the, it's unreformable right now. So I uh, I would get rid of all of them. And I would replace them with a board made up of people who actually represent Albertans. So there would have to be representatives from landowners, from municipalities, from indigenous groups, from from business. There should be, but but I, I point out that you know uh, th th this business is not just oil and gas, right? And so there's lots of businesses whose whose interests are not being supported by the AER right now. So if you're, I mean, so for example, if your business is a commercial consumer of uh, of of of, uh, of 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 a power from Atco or something, your interests are not the same as Atco, right? So um, 
but that's a different regulator. That's the Alberta Utilities Commission, yeah. the AUC, as opposed to the AER. So I would get I would get rid of the CEO, I would get rid of the board, replace it with a citizens board. That's the first step. And for me, like I put this in my economic package uh, because uh, as it stands right now, there's about $230 billion of unfunded environmental liabilities uh, that, uh, that, that Albertans will be left holding the bag for if we don't find some way to collect the money to for cleanup. And so we're, we're talking about oil sands tailings. That's the biggest chunk, but also uh, the literally tens and hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of abandoned wells or uh, uh, low service wells. A lot, of, a lot of oil and gas companies keep these, these wells ticking along with, with very little production just so they don't have to close them off, right? And so what 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 I'm worried about, and I think what an increasing number of Albertans are worried about, especially with the unfolding global energy transition, is that uh, that oil and gas companies are deliberately kicking the can down the street uh, until demand for oil and gas uh, declines, and then their businesses are less viable. They want to walk away from these liabilities, but if they do, if we allow them to walk away from these liabilities, uh, Alberta. You know, Albertans are going to be uh, stuck holding a, a bill for, you know, uh, eighty billion dollars, one hundred billion dollars, two hundred and sixty billion dollars. It'll, it'll it will cripple our economy. So we have we have uh, it'll cripple our government and cripple our economy. So we have a, we have a, a pressing need to have an Alberta energy regulator that actually enforces the rules because the rules that we need are on the books, right? About you know uh, about them making them put money aside to pay for these environmental liabilities. The problem is the regulator is not making them do that, right? So the regulator could make them pay their, their back taxes to municipalities. They could make them put more money into things like the orphan well fund. Um, and they could make them put more money aside to, you know, for uh, cleaning up the tailings ponds in, uh, in, in Fort McMurray. They could do those things, but they choose not to because they're a captured regulator. I'm going to ask a stupid political question right now just to put this on the table. Why do you think there's no will to do that right now? Why do you think that the Smith government is not forcing the AER to actually do its job and regulate the industry in a matter that would support, and I say that because I speak to a lot of rural municipal leaders who are left holding the bag, particularly up in northern Alberta, who are stuck with eight, 10, 15, 20 million dollars of unpaid property taxes, which are now being put onto the backs of the average Albertan who are pr yeah. proud property owners who are paying their property taxes, but now have to subsidize an industry that they weren't expecting to subsidize 10, 15 years ago when these wells were popping up. So your question is, why isn't Daniel why, Smith? Well, why, or, exactly. Why do you why, think Daniel yeah, why, why is it? Why isn't she forcing AER to do its job and, you know, and, and force oil companies to pay their bills? and put money aside for environmental cleanup. I, I think the answer is clear. It's because Daniel Smith and the UCP don't work for Albertans. They work for the oil in industry. And, um, you know, like the, the, the oil and gas industry is, an, is a very comfortable incumbent industry that is currently making record profits, but they're also looking nervously at the future. Uh, and they, under, you know, even though they won't admit it publicly, uh, behind closed doors and, and in investor conversations, they acknowledge that change is coming. They acknowledge that the, that, uh, the global energy transformation is well underway. And uh, they know that that has uh, huge implications for their profitability down the road. So, you know, like uh, economists talk about uh, what they call the incumbents di dilemma. Like when, when faced with disruption, incumbents basically have three choices. They can either uh, find a new business model Number one, they can adapt their existing business model or they can double down. And what's happening with uh, oil and gas here in Alberta, especially our big oil sands players, but it's throughout the whole industry, uh, they're choosing number three to double down. And, uh, and, and when incumbents in a disrupted industry choose to double down, they stop focusing on innovation and investment uh, and they start looking for people to protect them. And that's where Daniel Smith and the UCP come in. 
uh, their job is not to protect the interests of Albertans in a changing world. Instead, Daniel Smith and her, her government, their job is to protect the incumbents from disruption. And so we see it on the power side, you know, like, you know, why did Daniel Smith step in and uh, put a moratorium on the development of uh, renewable energy? Uh, it was to, to defend the interests of incumbents like ATCO, who are big supporters of Daniel Smith and the UCP. Um, why are they not requiring the AER to crack down on oil companies in terms of paying their taxes to municipalities? Why are they not forcing them uh, to live up to the letter of the law and put money aside for, to, you know, for environmental cleanup uh, on their wells and oil sands tailings? It's because that's not what, what Daniel Smith is there for. She's there to protect the incumbents from disruption and, and, and make it possible for them to pay as little as possible uh you know uh in, in a changing world and 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 I, and I think that this is not an accident it's by design uh they you know they they, they want to distract people but the real goal is to make sure that when the music stops and uh and these oil companies uh, are no longer making as much money as as they are right now um the you know the old costs are going to be left with someone else and and she's facilitating that it's it, it, it's shocking because, I mean, she was elected to represent the best interests of Albertans, but clearly she's representing the interests of an incumbent industry that um, wants to avoid paying uh, paying their bills. That's that's the bottom line. Again, I knew it was a stupid political question, but I needed to ask that question because you, <laughs> you're wanting to be the next premier of this province. But I want to turn to housing for a second, because housing is an issue yeah. that comes up when you talk to municipal leaders from the smallest municipality to the largest urban centers of Calgary and Edmonton. The issue is municipalities who listen to the show understand that housing is a developer slash uh, not a strict municipal issue. What is an issue for them is the infrastructure, and that is the pipes in the ground, the water that supplies the water to the housing, the sewers, the roadways, you name it, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Alberta municipalities earlier last year came out and they said LGFF, local government fiscal framework, needs to be increased from $700 million to potentially $1.3 billion a year to offset some of the deficits that municipalities are facing right now. Housing is a requirement. We are growing at a massive rate in this province, but infrastructure is not keeping up with that pace. How do you see yourself working with municipalities to address the infrastructure deficit that can bring in some of these houses that you are wanting to build in communities to ensure that people have a place to live, to drive down those costs of rentals, which are becoming, as you said, so close to uh, Vancouver or Toronto prices right now? Yeah. Uh, thanks for the question. I, it's really important. And the first thing that I would do is show respect to the municipalities. I mean, they are, a, you know, technically a lower order of government, but there, there is no one who has thought more deeply about the issues and the potential solutions than, uh, you know, people who are elected to municipal office at, in our towns and our cities around this province, and, and also the people who staff their um, their development offices. So uh, I know I've had conversations with councillors and um, and city officials in Edmonton, Calgary, uh, primarily. But I've had some com conversations with uh, people from smaller municipalities as well. They get it. They've been thinking about this really deeply for a long time. And so to your point about the the municipal infrastructure, they're on the front lines. They know that they're not. They don't have enough money to pay for the municipal infrastructure that's necessary to accommodate. The growth in this province. So that's the first thing. I would I, like uh, the municipalities have a lot of uh, of the answers, the, but the but they're not getting the funding that they need. And and I think most Albertans who are not sort of deeply involved in this space would be shocked to find out how little the province gives the municipalities to cover these things. Um, and in fact, the, like the, uh, the the first thing, I, and I remember when I when I learned this, I was I was shocked. The, our municipalities don't get any regular operating money from the province, like zero, like zero. It's like, it's nothing. Like, and so, uh, so like, like it just shocks me. Like, you know, like it, when you go at your door, most of the, most of the infrastructure that, that, that you use, whether it's your roads, your sidewalks, uh, you know, the utilities, it's all in municipal, right. And it, and it's, it's, it's foundational for our economy, but our provincial government, 
uh, gives nothing for ongoing operating spending. They do give money for infrastructure spending, but it's sporadic. Uh, it's hard to plan. And uh, and it's been falling. Like, I, like you know, even as our province, uh, like last year, we had the highest rate of population growth, uh, you know, since the 60s, I think. And, uh, and we're leading the country in, in population growth. People are still coming here until they figure out that the, the costs are not actually much lower here. I think they're going to figure that out. But um, but uh, but they're coming, and um, and that's a good thing because you know people are the economy, and so the more people we have, the stronger economy we're going to have. So we should encourage that. But municipal uh, provincial grants for municipalities for infrastructure are like a third of what they were a few years ago. Like how is how is that like on like it's crazy. Like you know like uh, so so respect money. Money, 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 right? I mean, like we like if we want to grow our economy, we need to support our municipalities, and um, and uh, yeah, and and you know, so those those are the I mean, those are the the, the biggest things, and uh, and honestly, like the, the, with the big cities, there was a deal under the New Democrats toward the end of their term for what they call city charters that would have given um, our cities more latitude in terms of their planning and their fundraising, um, and then the UCP tore that up. Uh, the UCP had this fixation on municipalities like and, and we've seen it with these you know these latest suggestions about introducing the municipal parties in uh in municipal elections um quickly are you, you in know, favor of that oh god no i mean like okay. <laughs> i would to tell you the truth i would like to get rid of parties at, at the the media's, like i'm running to be a party leader but like i'm <laughs> like if we could have nonpartisan government uh, at the provincial level, I'd actually be pleased about that. I don't see that happening any time soon. But this this push to get rid of municipal uh, the, the, to introduce uh, partisan politics into municipalities is all part of this agenda. They like, like what's happening is a, a lot of thoughtful, progressive people are getting elected to municipal councils to deal with these pressing issues like housing, like infrastructure, and uh, and the UCP hates the fact that progressive people are, are not only getting elected, but they're coming up with ideas that people like, but they can't fund them because they're not supported properly by the, by the provincial government. And so like, I would just, I, I would empower municipal governments. I think they, they know the solutions. They've got lots of great ideas, but they're underfunded. The other thing is, you know, and a lot of people don't realize this, municipalities can't take on debt. Uh, they're required by provincial legislation to balance their books every year, which, you know, on one hand is good, but on the other hand, the only way that you can finance long-term investments is to take on debt. I mean, I, I imagine if you were a business trying to expand your business and you couldn't take on a loan, that's crazy, right? And, but that's what we're, we're handcuffing our municipalities and limiting their options in terms of building the infrastructure that's necessary to make our uh make our our, our municipalities prosperous so like I, i'm a big supporter of municipal government i'm a big supporter of the ideas that they're being put on the table if i were premier i would fund them get out of the way support them where i could i, I like this idea of having a provincial um uh, housing uh, authority that wouldn't replace private sector development but would complement it and and my goal would be to have work hand in hand with the municipalities sort of like what the uh the federal government is doing through their housing accelerator they're making deals with the municipalities our provincial government should be making deals with the municipalities as well to support them in their initiatives we are coming up to April 22nd, which is the deadline to take out a membership for the Alberta NDP uh, to vote in the upcoming June leadership race. Uh, for those who are looking to buy a membership, again, the link to Gil's website is in the show notes, and a specific link to buy a membership is in the show notes as well, just in case you do want to buy take out a membership. But why should someone take out a membership today and support you in this bid to become the next leader of the Alberta NDP, Gil? Well, first of all, if I, I, you know, I think the majority of Albertans are either opposed to Daniel Smith and the UCP or they're skeptical about them, right? And and as I said at the outset, Daniel Smith is the wrong premier at, at a very crucial time in our province's history. We need someone with a big vision. We need someone who's going to be willing to pivot the province. She's not it. Uh, and she's also proven that she's no friend of municipalities. She's no friend of our healthcare system, our education system. And she's, you know, she's leading a government that's attacking some of our most vulnerable citizens. Um, we need to get rid of her, right? So uh, 
but in terms of the, the big question is okay so you know how how do we get who how do we get rid of her and who should do it i i submit that i'm in the best position to build a winning coalition that's necessary to to defeat her because the missing piece in that coalition is working Albertans. I have like I like I've spent my whole life, my whole adult life, standing up for working people in this province. It's been my purpose and my passion, and and because I spend all my time working with workers, I've developed an ability. I, like and I, and I have been a worker myself. That's the point, right? So uh, I know what people are concerned about. I know how to talk to these people, and and I know how to break enough off of them enough of them off of the of the UCP polyev train to form that that winning coalition and um and I would you know like you know I, I like my uh, opponents in this race they're all great people but what they're offering is a vision of this kind of watered down centrism um and they, they think that you know moving to the center is the way to to win this election um but with due respect uh, I think that's a fail, a failing strategy, uh, because people don't want uh, warmed over leftovers. They want to be inspired, and so you know, like, I, like I'd love to be proven wrong, but if any, like, but I don't think any of my competitors are talking about things like public power, public auto insurance, uh, you know, a housing uh, corporation to supplement the construction of housing, uh, you know, giving more power to municipalities to, to you know, to build the infrastructure to welcome all these people to these provinces, like. Like what's needed is a, you know, because the alternative, what we're getting now is, you know, it, what we're getting from the UCP now is uh, trickle down economics, which is a failed conservative experiment that we're all, that we've all been paying for. The alternative is a mixed economy with a bigger role for government to stand up on behalf of ordinary working people. <laughs> the bottom line for me is that the, in order to win the next election, we need to be more new Democrat, not less. This is a unique opportunity for us to be who we really are, win the election. But I, I think I, I'm sad to say it, but I think I'm the only one who's actually saying embrace who we are to win the next election and defeat Daniel Smith and, and actually build, you know, fix this province and, and have broadly pr uh, shared prosperity. I think I'm the only one who's saying it. Everyone else is is talking in these soft tones and saying, well, move to the center and, you know, create, you know, PC 2.0 or some version of the Liberal Party. Albertans have voted against Liberals. They voted against PCs. And they're not going to be inspired by it. And I'm afraid that if we go down that road of uh, putting too much water in our wine and, and, and moving away from who we really are, that's a recipe for losing the next election. So, so be, be big, be bold, be brave, be New Democrat, beat Daniel Smith in the next election. That's the recipe. And I think I'm the only one offering it. So my final question has to be then, what is the difference between a Smith, Alberta and a McGowan, Alberta? Well, it's broadly shared prosperity, right? I mean, that that's my goal is, is broadly shared prosperity in a changing world. Um, like, I, I'm afraid we've already seen that Daniel Smith's uh, Alberta is an intolerant Alberta, right? I mean... Um, you know, like, like going after the trans community, and I and I, and I don't want to just I want to say how how cynical that was. I mean, like they were losing on all their issues, right? Like they introduced an Alberta pension plan that no one wanted. They talked about you know a moratorium on um, on on uh, renewable energy, which no one wanted. They they talked about uh, you know municipal parties that no one wanted. Basically, everything that they were putting forward, people people not just opposed, but opposed a lot, right? So they cynically chose an issue in a particular framing where they thought they might get a majority of people uh, angry at a small minority group. So not only is it hor horrifying that they go after the small minority group, but it's even more horrifying to know that they did it just for political purposes, right? So that's the Daniel Smith, Alberta. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a mean-spirited, intolerant uh, uh, province that is driving away investment in the industries that that could pro provide prosperity for our future. It's a you know it's an Alberta that's under investing in uh, in in education that's privatizing our healthcare system. It's it's a it's a it's a nasty mean spirited uh, shrinking place because people will leave um, and, and like young people will leave. Uh, businesses won't come here to invest. You compare that to what I have on offer, which is a vision of a. Uh, of a province 
that provides broadly shared prosperity. Wages are good. We encourage investment from a wide range of industries. We recognize where the world is going. We skate to where the puck is going instead of where it has been. And, and it's one where, where, where people trust each other and support each other. And we don't you know, make judgments and, and the people will feel comfortable and safe being here regardless of you know, what, you know, where, where they come from, how they live their lives, who they love, right? I mean, that, that's, that, that's what gets me excited. Alberta could be that kind of place, but it won't be as long as we continue electing the UCP. Gil, I want to thank you. Hopefully your team isn't uh, upset that I took an hour instead of just the 40 minutes that I requested, <laughs> but I truly do appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and your campaign to sit down and chat about uh, your vision for Alberta, some municipal issues and uh, why people should take out a membership before April 22nd. So thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It was a great pleasure. Yeah, it was a great pleasure. Thank you, Chris. It was good. Now, before we let you go, I should note that for transparency's sake, my husband, one of the producers of this show, the Honorable Ricardo Miranda, served as an Alberta NDP MLA and cabinet minister in Rachel Notley's government from 2015 to 2019. So if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs like you saw today to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage from across Canada, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last year. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.